Okay, so here's a quick little problem regarding moles and uh, Avogadro's number. The question says, how many carbon atoms are contained in 2.8 grams of C2H4? So we have a mass, and we want to talk about number, number of particles. So what we have to understand is we can go uh, from moles uh, in two directions, right? We can go to mass using molar mass, and we can also go to number using Avogadro's number. But we can't go from mass to number, right? Because uh, every substance has a different mass. So we have to convert from mass to moles, and then from moles to number of particles. So uh, we've, got a gr we've got grams of C2H4. Let's get, let's get that in moles. So 2.8 grams. And then what is this way? Well, we've got 2 times 12 plus 4 times 1 is 24 plus 4 is 28. So that actually makes the math nice and easy. 1 mole over 28 grams. Remember, the way we're going to set these up, we're multiplying by a fraction where the top and bottom are equal, uh, but the units are going to cancel out. So we want to make sure 28 grams is on the bottom. So 2.8 grams times 1 mole over 28 grams equals 0 0.1 moles of C2H4. <clears throat> but we want to talk about a number of carbon atoms. And there are two carbon atoms per, 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 uh, per, per formula unit here. So uh, times 2, right, we're going to multiply this by 2. That's 0 0.2 moles of carbon atoms. Okay. So we went from a mass of C2H4 to moles of C2H4, and then we had to double that because within each molecule there are two carbon atoms. So there are twice as many carbon atoms as there are the, uh, the number of molecules. So let's just do an approximation. We've got 0 0.2 moles of carbon atoms times, we know that it's, uh, let's just round it to about 6. 6 times 10 to the 23rd uh, atoms per mole, uh, right? So atoms, particles, anything. That's just Avogadro's number. And so 0 0.2, that's a fifth. That's going to be about 1.2 times 10 to the 23rd. So 1.2 times, times 10 to the 23rd is right there. Uh, we're just taking a fifth of that. So remember, we went from mass to moles of, of C2H4 to moles of carbon atoms to a number of carbon atoms using Avogadro's number. So that's a nice little review for that. Okay, so this question is about electron configurations. So we have a configuration here, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. And the question says, which of the following species has the electron configuration shown above? And we have some options. So uh, this is very easy to do. Remember, with electron configurations, the easiest thing to do is remember where our blocks are. So this is the S block, this is the P block, this is the D block, and this is the F block. And we're just going to start at hydrogen and go across. So we know that hydrogen and helium, uh, they have electrons in the 1s orbital, right? This is the 1s uh, right there. So 1s2, right? We go 1, 2, 1s2. And then down to n equals 2, right? This is the n equals 1 row. This is the n equals 2 row. Uh, so here is 2s, the 2s orbitals, 2s1, 2s2. And then over here are the 2p orbitals, 2p, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So getting all the way to 2p6, we're at neon. Now we're getting into 3s1, 3s2, and then 3p1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So uh, argon, uh, the, the ground state electron configuration of argon is this right here. So let's look at the options. Now, it turns out that argon is not one of the options. So it's just slightly trickier uh, because we're not just looking at neutral elements. We're also looking at ions. So remember, ions, we're looking at a discrepancy in the number of electrons. Right? Uh, an ion has either gained or lost electrons. And so uh, we're looking for uh, something that has the same electron configuration as argon in its ground state. Now, oxygen, that's not going to work, right? That's, uh, that's 1s2. 2s2, 2p4, right? 1, 2, 3, 4. So that's no good. Neon is the same, uh, but it goes up to 2p6, 
right? Neon has a full two-piece subshell. So that doesn't work. But now we have potassium plus. We have a potassium cation. So here's potassium right here. So uh, potassium, the ground state electron configuration of potassium, it has an argon core. So we put argon in brackets like that. And then it has one 4s electron. So it's argon core and then 4s1. It's got one valence electron in that n equals 4 shell. But if it's k plus, it's lost one electron, right? A cation has lost electrons. So if it loses one electron, uh, that means that it has lost that 4s electron, and therefore its uh, its electron configuration is just the argon shell. It is the ar it is argon's ground state electron configuration. So K plus has is isoelectronic with ar with argon. So that is going to be the answer. Now they tried to trick you with Cl plus, right? They tried to make you think, oh, uh, chlorine plus. So it's chlorine plus an electron. So that's going to be like argon, but of course that that would be the case if it was the chloride anion. If it was Cl minus, that also would be a valid answer here because it would be it would be three uh, p five, and then the anion has gained one electron, so that would be three p six. But it is Cl plus, so that is not valid. It is actually the potassium cation, and uh, so that's the answer to this question, and that's a bit of practice with electron configurations. Okay, we have a couple questions regarding electron configuration. So first one says, which of the following ions has the same number of electrons as the bromide ion? So these are all ions. What we can do is we can compare them to, we, we can see uh, which, which elements ground state electron configuration these have. So like, for example, the bromide ion, uh, Br is right here. If it gains one electron, we're over here on krypton. So the bromide ion has krypton uh, electron configuration. Calcium 2 plus, here's calcium right here. If we lose two electrons, we go one, two. We jump back up to argon. So if calcium loses its two valence electrons to become calcium 2 plus, it becomes, it, it, it attains argon uh, electron configuration. So that one doesn't work. How about potassium plus? Here's potassium. So if we lose an electron, we also jump up to argon. So that one has argon electron configuration. How about strontium two plus? Here's strontium right here. If we lose two, we go boom, boom, krypton. So that ma that's a match. Bromide and strontium two plus each have krypton electron configuration. Just to be thorough, let's finish up. Iodide is right here. If that gains an electron, that, that attains xenon electron configuration. And chloride, chloride can gain one electron and get argon electron configuration as well. So we're just taking the, the ground state of an, of an element and then looking at the charge and the ion and we're removing or adding the appropriate number of electrons and then seeing what ground state electron configuration that looks like so that we can compare them. So these both have krypton electron configuration. Now the second one says, of the following electron configurations of neutral atoms, which represents an atom in an excited state? So an excited state, this, these are situations where the Aufbau principle is being violated, right? So normally we go 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6, and so forth, and we are rigidly following the Aufbau principle in terms of filling up a subshell and then going to the next subshell and then the next one. Uh, but when we have an excited state, what has happened is that one of the electrons has absorbed a photon of a particular energy and is able to jump up to a higher energy orbital. So it leaves the, the location where it was vacant and then jumps up somewhere. So we're looking for one, we're looking for an electron configuration that doesn't make sense as, as a ground state electron configuration where, where something has jumped up to occupy a higher, orb, a higher energy orbital leaving, uh, leaving some vacancy in the lower energy subshell. So first one, 1s2, 2s2, 2p5, that's, that's ground state fluorine. So that doesn't work. 
Uh, next one, 1s2, 2s2, 2p5, 3s2. So that's a little strange because you would expect that uh, this would be 2p6 before starting the 3s electron. So you would expect 2p6, 3s1. So this is probably sodium, right? We, we should have 3s1, but it's sodium where one of the 2p electrons has been promoted to fill the 3s, uh, the 3s orbital. So this is an excited sodium atom. So that is B. The others, just to be thorough, this 2p6, 3s1, that's ground state sodium, right? Uh, and then 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p2. We're over on silicon, and that is ground state. So that's, that's not excited. And then here, 3s2, 3p5, that gets us all the way to chlorine. Again, that's ground state. So the one that didn't work was that we, well, this is the tip off, the 2p5. We didn't finish filling that 2p subshell. And we and instead we have uh, additional we have three s electrons so that is definitely an excited state so those are two uh, good problems regarding electron configuration. Okay, let's try one regarding ionic radius. So this says which of the following best helps to account for the fact that the fluoride ion is smaller than the oxide ion. Uh, okay, so we've got some options here. This one's pretty straightforward, but it's there's a little bit to talk about because of the way the answer options are worded. It can make it a little bit confusing. So let's talk about what we know. We've got fluoride and we've got oxide. So fluoride, here's fluoride right there. Uh, so fluorine has nine protons. So nine protons and then F minus so it, it has gained one electron. So neutral fluorine has nine electrons, but if it gains one electron, it has neon electron configuration. So that's 10 electrons, right? Now oxide, <clears throat> oxygen atoms have eight protons. Uh, no matter what, any oxygen atom has eight protons. Oxygen two minus has gained two electrons. So neutral oxygen, eight electrons, and then if it gains two, also neon electron configuration, and we will have 10 electrons. So same number of electrons, different number of protons. So let's see which ones we can eliminate immediately. Uh, fluoride has more electrons than oxide. No, it doesn't. They have the same. So that's objectively wrong. <clears throat> A little more subtle, fluoride is more polarizable than oxide. Well, it's telling us that fluoride is smaller. And it's, it's a larger ion or atom or molecule that is more polarizable, right? The larger the electron cloud, the more it can shift around and create momentary dipoles and things of that nature. So, uh, so it's not, right? Fluoride is smaller, they've told us, so it is not more polarizable. So that's definitely wrong. Now, the other things are true. These other three statements are true, but this is asking which best helps to account for the discrepancy in ionic radius. So let's start here at the top. <clears throat> Fluoride has a larger nuclear mass than oxide. Well, it does. It has one additional proton, so there's more mass in the nucleus. However, can that explain the discrepancy in ionic radius? Right, it, it, this is not a gravitational effect, right? Where it's not about more mass makes it smaller because of gravity. That's that doesn't have anything to do with it, um, and we're not calculating molar mass or anything like that. So it's not the mass. It's not that there's a, a, the the mass of an additional nucleon in the nucleus. That's not why. Even though that is a true statement, it's not why what we're looking at here. But fluoride has a larger nuclear charge than oxide. That makes sense because we have one additional proton, a positively charged particle that is attracting the negatively charged electrons. So when you have an additional proton in the nucleus, that is, that is what is causing the, the radius to contract even a bit more, right? So <clears throat> that's why as we go to the right along a period, uh, the, the atomic radius goes down. And when you're looking at isoelectronic species like these, isoelectronic means the same number of electrons, uh, the, the ionic radius 
will decrease as the atomic number increases because you have the same number of electrons, so the electron repulsion is, is identical, but you have more protons. As you add protons to the nucleus, more attraction and it will contract. So this is the reason. <clears throat> A larger nuclear charge, that's the reason. This one down here, F is more electronegative, so that's a little bit tricky because that's also true. Uh, fluorine is more electronegative than oxygen, and that is uh, and, and electronegativity. It does have something to do with this, right? But the but the problem is that uh, electronegativity, right? A, a, a more electronegative atom will hold its electrons more tightly because of the larger nuclear charge, right? Fluorine is the most electronegative uh, element because it, it has uh, only just those two shells, so fewer shells than the others, and it has more, it has more protons than the, all the elements to the left in its period. So it's not that wrong, but this is more, I mean, it's not really wrong, but it's, this is more right. So this would be, if you felt, you know, if, if you put D, <clears throat> That would be understandable. I think that you would that that you might want to choose that one. It's just that B really explains the most clearly, right? Why is it? It's because it has one more proton. That's exactly why, right? Electronegativity is a property that that uh, that 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 is caused by the differing nuclear charges, right? So that's the most right answer. So this one was uh, maybe a little tricky with the wording here, but we're getting at the heart of the matter here in terms of ionic radii. So uh, that's a good one there. Okay, here's a quick question regarding nuclides. So this says, which of the following shows the correct number of protons, neutrons, and electrons in a neutral cesium-134 atom. So we have to know the numbers of uh, protons, neutrons, and electrons in that nuclide. So what are we going to do first? Cesium. It's cesium. Let's look on the periodic table. Find cesium. Okay, here is cesium right there. Cesium has an atomic number of 55. That means that by definition, every cesium atom must have 55 protons in its nucleus. If a, nuclei, if, a, if, a, if a nucleus has 55 protons, it is cesium. And if it does not have 55 protons, it is not cesium, period. So any answer that does not have 55 protons, we know is wrong. It cannot be cesium. So D and E are out. Now, it also says it is a neutral cesium atom. And so we know that uh, in order to cancel out the 55 positive charges, we need 55 negative charges to get a neutral atom. So anything that doesn't also have 55 electrons must be wrong. So C does not work. That's uh, too many electrons. So uh, neutral cesium atom. Now, this is the part with a little more uh, to, to do, but it's cesium-134. 134 is the mass number. That's the mass number for this nuclide. And so uh, the mass is uh, protons plus neutrons, right? You, the, the mass of the nucleus is, uh, is just you add up the protons and neutrons because they're both uh, roughly one atomic mass unit. So how many protons do we have? We've got 55. And, so, and the mass is 134. So the difference is going to be the number of neutrons. You take the mass number minus the atomic number, that gives you the number of neutrons because protons plus neutrons equals mass number. So we've got two options left. This one says 55 protons, 55 neutrons. That would only add up to 110. That does not work. But here is B. We've got 55 protons, 79 neutrons, which does get us up to 134, and then the 55 electrons that makes this neutral. So that's a nice problem, making sure you understand nuclides, uh, that you understand mass number, charge, atomic number, etc.